All right, welcome everyone to the April 2021 edition of the Pre-Hospital Care Research Forum Journal Club podcast. As a reminder, the Pre-Hospital Care Research Forum is dedicated to the promotion, education, and dissemination of pre-hospital research. And we believe it is the responsibility of emergency medical professionals worldwide to help build that body of evidence to examine pre-hospital emergency care. And here with the PCRF Journal Club podcast, we take a closer look at some of the latest research happening in EMS. I'm Dr. Remley Crow, and today I am joined by our panelists, Dr. Or Dave Page, Dr. Tony Fernandez, Dr. Bill Toon, and Jeff Rollman. It is also my extremely great pleasure to welcome some of the authors of today's paper. We have with us Jamal Chu, Dr. Timothy Chan, and Dr. Sheldon Cheskas. As a reminder, the name of the article we are reviewing is Machine Learning Based Dispatch of Drone Defibrillated, Drone Delivered Defibrillators, that's a tongue twister, for out of hospital cardiac arrest. And this was published in Resuscitation. As always, our discussion is paired with an article written by our very own columnist, Dr. Tony Fernandez in EMS World called Journal Watch. Uh, we encourage all of you to go check it out at emsworld.com under the category of education and training. Now, thank you all for joining us today. As we begin, I really wanna remind our audience, take advantage of the fact that you're here live, use that chat feature on your screen, and you can type in questions and comments. We will be bringing those into the conversation as we go. All right, let's get started. I just wanna thank all of the authors again for taking the time to be here with us today. I saw some of this excellent work presented at NEMSP earlier this year, and I have been anxious ever since to dive into the full manuscript. Um, but before we get started, let's just do a few introductions for our audience who may not yet know you. And so if you could, I'd just like to hear a little bit about who you are, what you do, and maybe even how you got involved in the crazy world of EMS research. Uh, let's kick it off with Jamal. Uh, yeah, so I am uh, just wrapping up my undergraduate studies right now at the University of Toronto in industrial engineering and starting a master's uh, under Professor Timothy Chan here. Uh, this is my first venture into EMS research. Uh, started it last summer and yeah, it was a very, very fun time, exciting opportunity. Yep, once you start, you're not gonna stop. So that's a good thing. <laughs> well, thanks so much for being here, Jamal. And Dr. Chan, could you introduce yourself? Sure, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Tim Chan. I'm a professor of industrial engineering at the University of Toronto. My areas are um, really in optimization and analytics methods applied to uh, problems in healthcare. So I'm very interested in problems around medical decision making or resource allocation or treatment design. Um, one of the areas that uh, I'm very active in is, is related to EMS research. This is something that I got involved in about a dozen years ago when I moved to Toronto and I got to meet several uh, individuals, including Lori Morrison, Steve Brooks, Sheldon here as well. And they really opened my eyes to this wonderful world of, uh, of research and scholarship. And uh, I've been very uh, grateful to be a part of this ever since. It's fantastic. I love it when fields cross paths. So cool to have you here. And Dr. Cheskis, welcome back. Yeah, thank you so much. So, yes, I'm Sheldon Jessica's medical director at Sunnybrook Center for Pre-Hospital Medicine, associate, um, associate professor of emerge medicine at University of Toronto. So I'm the principal investigator of our uh, AED on the fly research program uh, that's received funding from a variety of sources. And how we got involved in this is uh, really looking at the problem of rural and remote cardiac arrest, the inequities of care in rural remote communities, uh, as well as a uniformly poor survival rates for cardiac arrest in rural communities around the world. And that was actually my first hookup with Tim Chan uh, because he basically a number of years back uh, did some work uh, with us that looked at uh, geospatial mapping. So uh, geo uh, modeling uh, for our program, looking at 50,000 cardiac arrests over Southern Ontario and saying, hey, if we put drones in positions A, B, C, D, et cetera, uh, could we significantly save time based on EMS previous response times. And that mathematical modeling we published a number of years back, but that was our interest in myself working with Tim, and we worked on a number of things previously, but that was really the drone component of it. Uh, since that time, as everyone knows, we've been able to take the mathematical piece and put it into feasibility optimization and hopefully very shortly uh, implementation. So the critical piece of implementation is 
uh, when are you going to best dispatch drones? So when does it benefit uh, um, actually for the particular patient in a particular uh, environment? When is there a benefit to dispatch a drone as opposed to the EMS system? Uh, we always dispatch EMS system, but would we dispatch a drone with every call? And that's where we got into this technique um, that uh, Jamal is going to talk about, about using machine learning, being able to look at your historic rates, being able to take the data related to drone speed, drone direction, drone flight, um, and actually develop a model that gives our dispatchers a heads up in terms of, hey, in this situation, best to send the drone. In this situation, maybe best not to send the drone. And that really is the, is the uh, emphasis of this particular work. So uh, without further ado, I'd like uh, really, really Jamal and uh, be able to go on and, and speak about our work. Thanks for setting the table. That was so great. and I really want to reiterate one of the points that you made that I think is just so key to the implications of this work, and that is the implications for the rural environment. So this is about reducing disparities, and these drones look like they can be really important tools for that. So we will be talking more about that in the results. But first, let's talk a little bit about the objective here, of course, was to look at dispatch rules for a network of defibrillator carrying drones. Um, and the study took place in the Peel region of Canada. So some of our audience may not be as familiar with EMS in Canada and the Canadian region. So could you just tell us a little bit about where the study took place and the EMS system there? I better, I'll handle that one. I guess you want to take one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. I had to stop lunch for a second to get to that one. So uh, EM, uh, Peel region is in north of Toronto. It's here where I'm medical director, about a million people uh, live in Peel region. I have about 130,000 EMS calls a year. It's serviced by a tiered response system that dispatches both fire and EMS. So they're two separate systems. It's not a fire based system. Uh, paramedics are, are trained at both a, uh, a BLS and an ALS level, uh, fire response as a first responder uh, level. We do about, uh, in Peel region, about uh, 1,100 um, cardiac arrest treated uh, per year, so it's a, it's a very busy service. And the focus of this uh, work that we did was really uh, in Peel region, but specifically in the town of Caledon, a rural community in the northernmost part uh, of uh, of Peel region. So I think that gives you a sense uh, of sort of where we are, the dynamics and, and the type of uh, response that we usually get to these particular patients. Excellent. And if I could get you maybe just to give a little more background on what the drone dispatching would look like. So are there drone pilots? Can they see? Um, could you talk a little bit about how that AED Perfect. gets to the bystander? Yeah, so, so that's a great question. So when we plan this, so right now, the key part of this particular work and some of our mathematical modeling was putting the drones in a particular area that would optimize our response times based on historical values. Um, how the drone gets to the particular patient in our work is always beyond visual line of sight. So the drone is controlled by a um, uh, by a central command center that is nowhere near the area of where the drones are dispatched from. The drones would be dispatched from areas within Peel region in, in this area of the town of Caledon to the location based on the coordinates given to the 911 call taker. So just to be fair, Remley, so this is how we envision it. This is how we've looked at testing it. It's still not, it, this process is still not active yet so we haven't yet implemented but that's our vision and all our testing has all been done beyond visual line of sight hey, that's fascinating to me just in general um yeah. and then maybe this is for any of our authors but it's part an important part of the why behind this study is you know maybe it's not advantageous to dispatch a drone on every single out of hospital cardiac arrest um maybe could you talk a little about some of the advantages or disadvantages of dispatching drones so I think the, the, the theoretical advantage is clearly response time. Like the theoretical advantage is you have a big rural community. There are places where EMS cannot even get. So we have places in Ontario where there are islands. It's impossible to get an ambulance there. Putting a drone in those scenarios makes a lot of sense. So 
purely the benefit in, in the context of cardiac arrest is response time. My future vision, though, is really that of a medical drone that will carry not only a defibrillator, but carry epinephrine, franaflaxis, Narcan, Peropia, to stop the trauma bleed for trauma. So I see and envision the drone being used for a way larger number of medical emergencies than simply cardiac arrest. What are the downsides? Of, uh, of dispatching a drone. So the downsides is you're going to dispatch it to something that is not a cardiac arrest. So therefore you've wasted that resource, the cost, what have you. And cost is obviously going to be an issue. Do you need to make it cost effective for a particular region to be able to implement this? So all our work right now is funded by research. At the end of the day, a solution will need to be cost effective because eventually grants run out and eventually someone has to pay for that particular service. So that, the, the, the advantages are the ones that I mentioned. The challenges are making sure you get to the drone to as many patients who could benefit from it as possible. And I feel like any trauma call or any trauma process, you're going to have to accept a certain number of false positives. There's no question that'll be the key, but I think by increasing the ability to drones to respond to not just cardiac arrest and other medical emergencies, I think we can actually increase uh, the potential impact for pre-hospital care into the future. Absolutely, and under triage yeah, and over triage, triage are always... Better. Go ahead, Tim. Uh, so I was just gonna say, I would add to that just a couple of things. Um, so, you know, uh, we, we would have, it, in a hypothetical situation where we, where we do have this drone network, right, we, we would have a limited number of drones. So, uh, you know, if we dispatch a drone to, a, to something that turns out not to be a, a cardiac arrest, right, it's unavailable for another call. Right? So I think that's something to, to consider. If you have too many false positives in the system, then the system itself becomes uh, ineffective. Uh, and then also, you know, for those cases where, um, you know, every, every drone mission is going to uh, have some risk of something going wrong, right, just like any ambulance dispatch as well, right? So um, we would also want to minimize that risk. So again, for, for uh, cardiac arrest that um, where, let's say, it's not going to beat the ambulance there, um, then, then why risk anything uh, negative potentially happening uh, if you're very certain the ambulance is going to get there first, right? And that's why these kinds of models are so important because, like you said, you know, this could be for any kind of ambulance response, not even just a drone response that has these yeah. advantages and disadvantages of sending a mission. So I love yeah. that. I think this has been some really great background setting us up, but I'm ready to bring on Dr. Tony Fernandez and start getting into the math, which I know I'm anxious to do. <laughs> so Tony, would you like to walk us through some of our methods? Absolutely. And thank you all for being here today. I really appreciate your time. Um, <clears throat> this is a great study. And I, I got to tell you, there's there's not a lot of uh, uh, studies where I, I really am having a, a hard time not turning the pages quick enough. So this is, uh, this is great. And thanks for doing it. Thanks for being here. I, I want to talk a little bit about how you collected these data. Um, where, where, where did they originate from? How did you get access to them? And then maybe a little bit about how you identified your uh, suspected out of hospital cardiac arrest cases. As far as data collection goes, maybe again, this is something that Shell can address. This was all provided uh, to us from, um, from one of the paramedics working in the service there. Yes, yeah, so our data was basically prepared, uh, Tony, from our historical database in the region. We have a historical database that captures everything related to the Epstein variables, response time, uh, and all components of cardiac arrest care to the patients in that region. So what we did was we provided all this information to Tim and his group uh, with respect to where the cardiac arrest occurred, um, what the... Um, with the where, where, the, where the vehicles were stationed at the time, time of day, day of year, all that information was provided to them uh, to be able to use in their modeling. So we provided to the engineers a background, really cardiac arrest data, similar to I think, you know, which Remley would have available as part of our SO database. It was just very, very similar. Very cool. And it's great to have access to such a wealth of data. Um, so you looked at suspected cardiac arrest cases, and uh, you developed some drone dispatch rules. Uh, can can you tell us about tell the audience about how those were developed um, and and implemented in your study? Yeah, I, I can take that question. So the the first step to to the dispatch rule is to predict the the ambulance response time. 
right? Because the whole the whole goal is we only want to dispatch the drone if it's going to beat the ambulance there. If it doesn't beat the ambulance there, there's no benefit to, to dispatching it. So uh, the first step was predicting the ambulance response time, which we used uh, two different kinds of models for. Uh, we tried a linear regression model as well as uh, neural network models. Uh, we wanted to compare those to each other. Uh, and then the other side to it is uh, computing how long the drone would take to, to get there. So we compute the drone, uh, the drone response time using uh, parameters of the drone. So you know how, what's its velocity, what's its acceleration, uh, all of that. Uh, and an important thing is, so you know, uh, with the drones, it's a we used a straight line distance. So you know, a drone comes up from its base, it goes straight to the to its response. Versus the ambulance, it's going to have to take the road. So depending on where where it is, that could be a straight line if you're lucky, but most likely it's going to have to have to uh, turn along along the road somewhere. Uh, so yeah, and we can we compare those two those two times. And the one thing that we added to uh, to to those dispatches is a parameter that we call delta. So what what this parameter was for was to uh, be either more more liberal with with uh, sending up the drones because uh, the because 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 so when when we set when we make the decision there is either it's going to uh, uh, improve response time or it's not right and sending a drone that imp improves response time is obviously good sending a drone that does not improve response time is bad because of the cost but not sending a drone which could have improved response time is probably worse because you're affecting the response time there. So we wanted to moderate how, instead of just saying, you know, how many predict, how many dispatches that we get correct, it's actually looking at, you know, how many true positives when, or sorry, true, uh, true negatives, uh, sorry, false positives is what I meant to say. How many false positives, when, when, we, when did we send a drone and it did not uh, beat the ambulance? versus how many false negatives, when did we not send the drone, when it could be the analyst, those are two very different uh, penalties, right? So uh, we added this parameter delta that we say, when the predicted time of the ambulance is a certain value, we will add a buffer time, this delta time, a buffer say, you know, you know, we're going to account for it being a bit slower so that it's more, it's, uh, we're more liberal in sending out this drone so that we, reduce those uh, false negatives of, of, uh, of missed opportunity to improve response time. Yeah, and I thought it was really interesting with your buffer times that you looked at all the way from uh, zero seconds all the way up to, I believe it was 250 seconds for the cutoff. Um, that's, I think that's a wide range and you can, you can give a lot of information systems uh, to, for them to utilize based on how they, they operate. I think that was great. Um, you mentioned this earlier, and, and I want to dive into it just a little bit. Um, for folks who don't uh, aren't familiar with flying drones, uh, you mentioned in, in the paper things like uh, ascent time, horizontal acceleration, cruising speed, descent velocity, and the like. Um, can you tell us a little bit about these measures and kind of why they were important to specify for your study? Yeah, so for the drone to get from the drone base to to the patient, it's you know it starts at at the base on the ground. It's going to have to fly up, then fly horizontally, and then and then land. There's buildings in the way, obviously, so we, we can't just like fly at you know ten feet above the ground because there's obstacles. So uh, those parameters are are to account for that that full flight path of going up, accelerating, and then and then coming down. It really is fascinating, and one of the things you had to do. To do this was to determine your optimal drone base location. And I think this was a, a really important part of your study. And I mean, can you tell our audience a little bit about how those were determined? Yeah, so that that's using a, a mathematical optimization model that uh, that it's going to place those bases strategically to to minimize the average uh, response time. So uh, the way it works is. We, we give it a set of candidate bases. So we said, uh, you know, we can place drones at, uh, 
of all 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 fire police and uh, EMS stations uh, and then we tell it how many bases it's allowed to place so for the uh, majority of the study it was three bases we did sensitivity analysis saying if there was you know one two three four or five uh, and what the model does is you know find the optimal three bases of those candidate set of candidate bases and uh, and from those from each of those bases you know there's always going to be that baseline uh, ambulance response time and then you know where it, which bases should we select that we can improve that baseline as much as possible very very interesting stuff um, so let's move on to I really enjoyed reading how you dealt with ambulance response times and you had historical data, but you also used uh, some statistical methods to predict ambulance response times. And can you tell our audience a little bit about why that was important rather than solely focusing on historical response times? Yeah, because uh, so it, it, if this were to be, if drone to, drones would, were to be implemented in practice, uh, we have to decide when the call comes in, do we send the drone, do we not send the drone? At that point in time, you do not know how long the ambulance is going to take to get there. We can approximate it, but we do not know for sure. So that's why we use models to predict given information that we know when the call comes in. So, you know, where the patient is, where the ambulance is, what time of day, day of the week, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we're going to predict how long it's going to take for that ambulance to to get to the patient because we don't we can't see the feature we don't know how long it's going to be yeah and i'll just add to that um that you know that variability is important to account for right because uh you know going forward in the future prospectively we wouldn't know exactly that it would take you know uh seven minutes and 14 seconds to get there right like we might look at the historical data and it'll say that but that certainly wouldn't be the case prospectively but i think that's something that we wanted to really build into the model to demonstrate how this prediction model like you could imagine using something like this prospectively someone sitting at, at the command center would say okay i i think it's going to take an ambulance seven and a half minutes to get there should i use the drone or not right yeah, no, I totally agree, Tim, and I think that's the key. And I think, as we all know in EMS with dispatch, the historical data, it may not tell you um, were these cases, were the ambulance dispatched from the actual station or were they actually roving in the area and then were dispatched from that area? So therefore, your, your start point is different based on that historical piece. So I think this is important. What was really interesting about this was we realized this in the implementation, as we move to the implementation phase, is that the optimal site for location of the actual drones turned out to be two of the EMS stations, which is hilarious in this huge area the best place you can find is actually where the two EMS stations were already. And you could imagine that the optimal location may not be EMS, police, or fire. It may actually be somewhere completely unrelated. But if it is somewhere completely unrelated, then you need to think about when you get to implementation, how are you going to watch that spot? Do you know what I mean? How can you, you can't just put a drone base in the middle of McDonald's. You know what I mean? Like it is, there's those other nuances that take you from implementation where this is the best i mean optimization to implementation where you may have to have a trade-off between where the best spot is uh, based on your historical patterns or your modeling versus what reality will allow you to place the drone station at but i just i thought it was funny that our two top sites were actually places were actually the ems stations that is out of all the places that that's but can yeah, we talk very, about these methods on that reference mcdonald's over tim hortons yeah <laughs> in canada we go to tim hortons you're right yeah tim horton it's a very canadian uh, context <laughs> so I, I i don't want to hold this up too much more from your fascinating results but there are some things i think we need to uh just define or help our audience understand so that they can they can understand your results in the first two um, uh, can you explain your never dispatched and your always dispatched calculations? Yeah, so those those two uh, the policies are kind of our baselines. So never dispatch is drones do not exist, just what, what happened historically when we just had ambulances. The always dispatch is, uh, is, is 
you know, in the name, you're, you're always dispatching the drone, you're never not dispatching it. And that is to compare to what previous studies have done that show that, uh, show that having drones can improve response time. So what we wanted to do in the study is show that, you know, our, uh, our machine learning based dispatch policies can maintain the same or, or very similar response time improvement over the never dispatch, the historical response times that the always dispatch can, but with uh, much fewer uh, dispatches, so saving uh, saving the cost of sending the drone, the risk of of, of accidents and, and all that. Right. No, thank you for that. And just a couple more. Um, we've talked about on this podcast before sensitivity and specificity, but I think it's important to to define it and for our audience to understand how they relate to your study uh, when we get to those results. So can you talk a little bit about what, for your study, what sensitivity and specificity and accuracy, um, how they should be interpreted for our audience? That's a great question. Yeah. Oh, do you want to take that, Sheldon? No, 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 go ahead. Okay. That's, that's, yeah. I leave that to you. Okay, yeah, so uh, we define a true positive is uh, you know, positive being the decision to send a drone. So true positive is we sent the drone and it arrived before EMS, so it improved response time. The false positive is, you know, we send the drone, but it arrived after the, the EMS, so it did not improve response time. It was a bad decision to send the drone. And then the negatives are when you don't send the drone. So a true negative is you don't send the drone and there was no potential improvement that we lost. And the, uh, the false negative is not sending the drone when it could have improved response time. And that was a, a large focus was on those false negatives because that's, those are, are, are the most harmful is, you know, we had the opportunity to improve response time, but the dispatch role did, did not, uh, did not send the drone in that, in that scenario. Yep. And this might be a Great. good time to bring in an audience question here, and um, it's about the actual system itself. So Chris asks that this system uses EMD, so emergency medical dispatch, including MPDS. So in your experience, are there very few false positives, or um, is that something that you looked at? So I think maybe just to clarify something here, when we when we say about a false positive, we're not um, talking about whether or not the the actual call was a false positive cardiac arrest, like if it was a suspected arrest, but it didn't it turned out to be you know just someone uh, unconscious because they you know for some other reason. Um, th th we're we're talking about false positives and true positives related to kind of the the drone dispatch decision and whether or not it was the right decision. Uh, but we are treating all of these cases as um, suspected cardiac risks because that's what they were coded as. And you know, before you, before the ambulance crew gets there, you don't really know anyway, right? So you you have to dispatch the ambulance to all these suspected cases to begin with. Um, I don't I, I don't know if Michelle can comment on how many kind of suspected. Uh, yeah, no, that's uh, I think that's a, it's a fantastic question, right? Because up to thirty percent may be something different. Do you know what I mean? Like you're dispatching it, and this is going to be the trick when we put this into real life. Is you get that night? It's there's going to be a trade-off, right? So 911 calls comes in, EMS fire gets dispatched. To make this work, drones going to need to be dispatched at the same time. But you're going to be dispatched with the same information at the time that fire and ambulance has. Somewhere in that call, there may be information that comes to you that it's not a cardiac arrest. Well, it's easy. Um, ambulance keeps going, the drone turns back. You know, we get the information, drone turns back. So that part is easy. Um, but to be optimally effective, they have to be sent together. Hence, there is the potential for a higher number of false positives. What we're going to have is our own drone dispatcher will be listening to the information. It becomes obvious it's not a cardiac arrest. As more information comes in, the drone turns back. So I think that's a, that's a big key to this particular uh, topic. But again, it, Tim is 100% correct. The true positive, false positive in this really relates to the dispatch rule, not in fact related to whether the patient was a cardiac arrest or not. Was an excellent very last, one, very last one before we get to these results. Uh, I thought you, you calculated a very interesting and useful metric in your harmful false positives. Um, so can you can you talk to us a little bit about that metric? Yeah, so uh, like, like I mentioned before, there's there's a very different uh, impact of a false positive versus a false negative, right? 
false negative is bad, it, it hurts response time. False positive, for the most part, it's about, uh, you know, the resources used to, to make that dispatch. However, there are the cases where a, a uh, false positive can occupy a drone, like when you, when you dispatch a drone, it's, it's being used, and then a, another uh, suspected or uh, cardiac arrest call comes in, and now that because that, that drone is flying to a different patient, it cannot be dispatched to this new call. So the harmful false positives are the false positive where we send a drone, which is a false positive, so it does not improve response time. And if we had not sent that drone, it would have been available to be sent to a different patient where it would have improved response time. So harmful false positives are the ones that are negatively affecting response time because of uh, occupying the drone so it can't be used uh, for someone else. Fantastic. Thank you again. That was very, very clear. Um, before uh, I, I hold us back any longer uh, from the results, I just want to open it up to any other panelists to see if they have any uh, methods related questions for our authors. Yes, I have a quick methods question. First of all, thank you all so much for joining us and sharing this excellent research from up north. Uh, great to hear from our Canadian friends. Um, I wanted to talk about an important assumption that you mentioned. So, of course, AEDs, um, the AED drone, when it arrives, it's not going to be put on the patient's chest, the pads, instantly. And then at the same time, paramedics and the ambulance, they don't just arrive on the scene and then instantly, you know, they're right next to the patient and treating the patient. And I believe your assumption in this study was that that time interval from ambulance arrival on scene to um, being at the patient's side and then AED drone arrival to being at the patient's side was equivalent. I was wondering if you have any idea what that time interval is and then um, if you did any kind of pilot testing on that or if you could just talk a little bit more about that assumption. Thank you. So I'll let Jamal and Tim handle the assumption and I'll give the, the real world uh, answer in terms of how this actually really does work. So in terms of the modeling, um, in order to make a fair comparison with ambulance, right? So what we want to do is we wanted to measure the time of dispatch. We assume ambulance and drone are dispatched at the same time to, to, a, to a comparable kind of ending point of, of what we call response time. So for the ambulance, we would assume it's, let's say the wheel stop uh, time, right? And then there's, there's obviously some time it takes the paramedics to get to the patient's side, but we don't consider that. Whereas for us, we are um, basically saying uh, the comparable for drones would be basically when the AED arrives is let's say dropped from the from the uh, drone if, if that's the mode of delivery for the drone right so in both cases there would still be some time uh, fr uh, from when to get the AED basically onto the onto the patient and so that I guess that's the time that Sheldon's going to talk about but at least for this first part we wanted to keep it as consistent as possible to make it a fair comparison yeah and I think Tim that's perfect because what you're saying is that this is when the ambulance arrives seen and the drone where I've seen will be the same time. That's actually the when the actual defibrillator hits the ground from the drop from the drone. So the key point here is, and I think it's an excellent one, is in the real world, how are you going to ensure that the drone, the AED that's dropped by the drone is going to be used by this bystander in an effective manner? And I can tell you that we did community consultation in the areas that we talked about this it was amazing to hear back from the community because what they all told us was the same thing we love drones how the hell do you use an aed so it's amazing how how you know the you come up with this what we think is a brilliant idea to improve responses but if no one knows how to use an aed you're back at square one and i think this is the ultimate issue with respect to why public access to fibrillation programs haven't been as effective as we had thought. We put them all places where we think they're going to make a difference. But the trouble is 80%, 75, 80% are in public locations. We can't get to them quick enough and there's no AED in those areas. And this is where we can make a big difference. So what we have done in our optimization flights is we've embedded in the casing of the actual case that holds the drone, a actually FaceTime app. 
So what happens is the bystander is talked through this by the dispatch. They open up the case. There's a phone. We're talking directly to the individual on how to use the AED. I can tell you right now in our testing, overwhelmingly, the bystanders loved this. They felt like someone was, was there with them, and it demystified the use of the AED. I think that's a critical component to make this work. If you drop a drone and AED down, no one knows how to use it, you're back at square one again. So we found this made a huge difference, and we're putting it into place in all our future work because we really found that the bystanders who we work with and we use people who never knew about a cardiac arrest they never took a nine they never took a cardiac a cpr course we wanted people as blind as a day and say okay let's see how you do it and what they said to us inter it was interesting they said turn off those stupid voice prompts let me just talk to the guy on the phone that guy that i'm seeing right here do you know what i mean so it's amazing and i've told now the defibrillator companies you can forget the aed voice prompts what you need to do is build into the AED a a, 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 a TV, a camera, something small where they can see someone talking to them. I'm sure the cost would be too much to do it, but if you want to actually get buy-in, that's how you get buy-in. And we, we really found it in spades during our test flight. So uh, I thought that would help it, but I think Tim's answer, I start for the long-winded answer, but Tim is right, arrive scene versus when the actual drone hit the ground, that's the time. Both are going to have some other 30 to 45 seconds to a minute to actually apply the AD. Hopefully, it'll be quicker once we get the, the bystander right into being able to use this. I, I just want to echo your thoughts. What a great, uh, great, just what great insight about how the, the uh, human machine interface. Yeah. changes everything and it's it's everything from having the dispatcher talk somebody through doing something like putting pressure on a wound that's bleeding to <clears throat> how to use this piece of technology to just drop from the sky and i'm going to cheat a little bit here because i've heard you talk in the past and 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 i'm fascinated by the degree to which i think i think you're just you're just doing amazing work you're extremely professional and you're wonderful researchers the last time I, 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 I heard you speak about this, even the distance by which you drop the drone is a response time issue. Yep. And I wondered if you would speak a little bit to that, that the, the, if, if anywhere in your methods you thought, how afraid were the, the people on the scene to watch the defibrillator drop okay. from the sky? Because landing the drone and shutting it off is one concept and then you have to detach the defibrillator so that just seems like it, it it adds time right even every every second counts about how how do you approach this thing that was just buzzing yeah. and then the other thing is what it just just this thing almost crushed me and now it's here and and did it drop right in front of me or how, what's the distance that i have to drop it in front of the patient without injuring something else or or someone else yeah. And and not causing panic, going, oh, this thing just dropped from the sky. Did did any yeah. of that play into the, the methods calculations? So I, I, I'll speak to this because it didn't go into the methods. This isn't purely mathematical modeling. What I will say to you is a brilliant insight into how we went through this phase from feasibility to optimization to implementation. We looked at, it was very clear to us early on, Transport Canada, and I doubt the FAA will allow you to land the drone and just take the AD out of it. Impossible. With the wings flying, they're going to be too scared of, uh, of, of injury. So therefore, you have two other options. One is basically a bungee cord that comes out of the drone that actually drops the AD, or a free fall drop of the AED from the drone, and then the drone doesn't stop, the drone just flies back to its base. So at no time will the drone be landing and holding it. It's going to be either a bungee cord or a drop from a different height. So what we uh, did was we've tested this now uh, in terms of dropping from a height of four meters versus dropping from a height of 20 meters. And what we found was the time is about the same, and it's dependent on the drone descent time. So 
Initially, when we first started this, our drone descent time was 0.4 meters per second. When we optimized it, we were able to add we were able to add technology that improved the descent time to two meters per second. That's a huge difference in terms of coming down. And the issue you have to be careful of is you come down too fast, it's like a helicopter that can potentially spin out of control. But what we found is that optimum height is going to be around five to six meters. It drops the AED in a package in a in a, in a protected package and then takes off. Um, what you will see is that as the drone gets closer to the ground, it gets noisier. So the for the bystander to use it, they get the, you know that's one thing. Uh, but usually the drone picks up, takes off, drops it, and that's fine. But I think the dropping or the bungee is the issue. Trouble with bungee is. People get excited, eh? They see the thing coming, a bungee cord come out, they want to pull it, and they actually can affect the way the drone flies. So the bungee more likely will be where the bungee is actually within the actual drone, and then the bungee cord comes down, drops the AED, and then the bungee is, is pulled back up. So we've looked at a number of these things. Um, the distance, when we first started, we were dropping the drone 100 meters away from the bystander. Now we've got it down to 10 meters away from the bystander. So we can be very, very precise. And the reason for the precision is a drone we use has a camera so that you can see on the way down to ensure that you're not landing it. If I give you a GPS coordinate, Tony, you know what, that GPS coordinate may be to the roof. What do I want to drop a drone to the roof? Okay, so you want to make sure it lands in a spot. So we tell the, the 911 tells the bystander, go put a towel on your front line. And that's what we aim at. Okay, so then we know exactly where we're actually going to drop the actual device because a GPS coordinate may not be good enough. So if you don't have a camera that you can see down, forget it, you're not going to be able to do this properly. I'm officially Amazing applying issue. for drone pilot. <laughs> I know, I think I'm going to do that too. Can you imagine what fun that would be? Yeah. What, what, an, what an incredible number of variables too. Wow. Yeah. And this actually brings in a, one of our audience questions fits well here, I think, from Chris about, uh, Sheldon, you mentioned that the bystanders like having the coaching on the phone. So are your EMDs coaching the bystanders in CPR and an AED retrieval? Um, I'm guessing they can't see the person, but they remain on the line? Right. So what, what, what would happen, and again, remember, the, these are all phases that we're working on. But for us, 911 dispatcher is going to dispatch and give the bystander the same instructions as they would normally. But what they'll tell them is that the AE drone has been dispatched and AED is coming to you. Then once, in fact, that AED is in the hands of the bystander, then our drone dispatcher will take over the call from the 911 operator. That's how we have it envisioned, and that's what we've done in our implementation flight. So um, that's the process that we've thought through in terms of, and again, it was really, for people who had never used it before, they were really happy in terms of the, the, the comfort they had with someone on the other end of the line. Yeah, I think that's really an important question. Great question from Chris. Yeah, really good. All right, Tony, do we have any more methods questions? Or are we ready to dive into some of these numbers? I think let's dive in. Okay, so if we take a look at the next figure, figure two, like you said, this is a pretty big system. There was 6,700 cardiac arrests included in this five-year study period. Um, I want to talk about the bane of most researchers' existence, because you know I have to, missing data. Uh, so we see that the GPS location was missing for a lot of these records. I'm curious as to whether you have any insight as to why GPS location tends to be missing. Is it systematic, like are more of these in rural areas, or could it be kind of considered missing at random? Uh, what I noticed in looking at the data is that there was more missing GPS coordinates uh, in the earlier years. So the data is from 2015 to 2019. So there was more missing from the earlier years. I don't know if Sheldon might be able to speak to as why exactly. Yeah, yeah I'm not sure why it would be missing. I would assume, uh, Remley, that it is missing at random. Um, and it's one of the, the questions, uh, what, I, I can't recall now how many coordinates we gave it to. Was it to four or five decimal places? I can't remember what we gave it with respect to GPS coordinates. Uh, I do not know the exact precision, sorry. Okay. But I think it's really the timing of the data. I think with our data, I think this is missing at random, but the newer data, I think, had much less missingness than the data that was older. That makes yeah. a lot oh, of sense. 
Yeah, to, to add in, so there, there was a bunch of data that was precision of like zero decimal places. So the whole region was exactly the same or within one, because uh, it's longitude and latitude. So it's like all exactly the same. So it's essentially missing, even though there was values there. That, yeah, that's a really important point is also like this interface with the, the CAD system or however we're getting those longitudes, latitudes and the GPS. So yeah. there's a lot of factors that play into this that maybe you know, I hadn't considered off the bat until I read this. Yeah, so, 100%. In all, there were over 3,500 cases of OHCA included in this modeling. And so if we take a look at table two, I think it's, um, or table one, actually, excuse me, we'll start with that. Taking a look at just the characteristics of OHC in Canada, a couple of things that you know called out to me were the median age is about standard at 69. Um, again, this was such an important point that I think Shell mentioned, public location was only 14%. So having those AEDs in public locations isn't always as useful as being able to get it to a residence. Um, and then taking a look at bystander witness, 28%, and then bystander initiated CPR is 26%. Is this something standard for the region, or do you know what bystander yeah. CPR looks like in Canada? Do you think drones yeah. might help with that? Uh, so this is really, really low, okay? And I think this is because of the location that you're in. If you're looking at a rural area, you're just going to have a smaller number of risks. Our bystander CPR rates, um, I know when we published our dose VF study, again, these are, these are VF witness patients, so you're talking about 60 to 70 percent and bystander CPR rates well above 50 percent. So I think these are way lower than our characteristic or historic, there are current numbers in terms of both these uh, parameters. Those are very, very low. Yeah, and I can see a world where having, you know, knowing that the AED drone is on its way maybe could help with this. So I think mm -hmm. that's an important thing to take into account. Um, now, Let's get into the exciting results of what the model showed. So uh, table two shows the first response times and, and then figure three of course has the nice visual representation, but let's take a look at table two and think about um, the various response time models. And maybe Jamal, you can walk us through, what are some of your high level like key takeaway findings from this? Yeah, so the, the, the main takeaway is that no matter what model is used, uh, any of the machine learning based models always dispatched, they're all uh, big improvements over not having drones. So no matter what is used, uh, there is that improvement in response time. And then the uh, other other very large takeaway is uh, that there's not too much of a difference in that response time between the, uh, the different models. So for example, if we're just looking at the mean and median, it's you know, 4.1 or 4.2 across the board for mean, and 3.9 across the board for median. So we can, so what that's, that's showing is that we can maintain that exact same mean and median, that's the exact same improvement response time with our uh, machine learning based dispatch rules. Oh, uh, the, so the, the, same, the same response time of machine learning dispatch rules compared to the always dispatch. But if we look at the uh, number of dispatches, so in this table, uh, we can, have that exact same response time, but with 30% less dispatches. So we're dispatching a lot fewer drones, but we still maintain the uh, benefit to response time. Yeah, and I'll just add to that, that um, exactly as Jamal said, I mean, if you if you look at all these linear regression and neural network results, I mean, the response times are all very similar, but where you do see the most sensitivity is around resource use and uh, and the specificity number right and uh, and as uh, tony mentioned um earlier this harmful false positive you see that in the last column there so really this this delta parameter we like to think of it as like a like um a tunable parameter right so a different service that has a perhaps a, a unique risk sensitivity or risk tolerance to or or sort of a cost effectiveness trade-off in terms of how they want to do dispatch they can think about this as really a family of, of models and, and, and uh, they can use this to tailor the model to kind of suit their sensitivity specificity trade-off. And, and you do see that there are quite significant differences in the number of drone dispatches, the number of harmful cause positives as you adjust this delta parameter, but the overall response times are, are looking very similar. Yeah, well, and to add, uh, to add on ahead. to that, on the discussion with the harmful false positives, as we mentioned earlier, a lot of data was not used because of missing uh, GPS location and, and whatnot. So 
uh, the harmful false positives that we have here is actually uh, a large underestimate of what uh, it would be in reality because I, because the the per, like the percent that are harmful false positives is going to be more as there are the cardiac arrests are more densely uh, like close together and as so yeah well what I'm trying to say is you know we have a specific time period you know if we remove half of the OHCAs that are that are in that time period. The probability that two are that are close together that are going to have a conflict of, of occupying resources uh, that could have been used for another one is is going to go down. So if all of these OHCAs were in the data set, uh, that harmful false positive number would probably grow uh, quite a bit. And I, I think that is just a key balancing measure to take into account that harmful false positive rate. And I really like that you all displayed so many different versions of this model, because as you were saying, it's not a one size fits all, depending on your system and your resources, there's really a potential to want to adjust this. And that's true with any of our you know, screening instruments, like stroke screening, how much sensitivity do you need versus how much specificity, or you know, we talk about under triage and over triage a lot. So. For me, having all of these visuals and all of these different models was just really helpful. And you should all be commended for presenting so much detailed work here. Nerd. Total nerd. I can't help myself. <laughs> I love math. Um, so I am curious about, um, and actually this, I'll take a question from the audience because I think this is a really good one. Do you all think that there is further expansion of these models to drone usage for other conditions or combinations of conditions? For example, like, would you have a separate drone for potentially naloxone or whole blood, or do you see these as like singular models for drones? Yeah, so whoever the question is, is an excellent question. And 100%, this, I see this, my interest initially in this is a resuscitation researcher. So I was really into it from a cardiac arrest point of view. There's no question in my mind that we are not going to just do this may be year one of our plan, but our further year, and we've already talked with a number of drone companies and a number of other interested parties. Um, it's going to be, a, it, there will be definitely use of a medical drone, something that's going to be able to affect multi, it'll make it way more cost effective, it'll be able to impact greater number of pre-hospital emergencies, it'll do, it'll do much more for the greater good in terms of epi, naloxone, as I mentioned earlier, bleeding kits, like some of these, some of these areas are impossible for EMS to get to, and I can't, I can clearly see a benefit for a wider range of emergencies. I think one of the tricky things people need to understand is this is really focused on the rural area. You'll learn in the drone business, people tell you whatever you want to hear, and people may see drones flying around downtown Toronto or downtown New York. That's not going to be happening. It's just you have to take into account wind shear, wind speeds, wind gusts. They are not amenable to be used in some of these urban areas. But to be frank, I don't think we'd see a huge benefit in response time in the urban areas on in our current system. Where we'll see a huge benefit is in these rural, much more difficult to see areas. So I agree with the question. Uh, no question you're going to see this being used in a much larger number of medical emergencies, not simply cardiac arrest. Yes, thanks for the excellent question, Bryce. Yeah. I would just add one more thing that the, the models that we've developed here are very general. Not, there's nothing inherently specific about cardiac arrest in here, that if we're talking about drone delivery of naloxone or drone delivery yeah. of, of trauma, you know, tourniquets yeah. or whatever, trauma kits, um, uh, the same type of modeling around, you know, where do we locate bases, how many drones do we put in each base, how do we dispatch drones to these different types of emergencies, it's all a very generalizable uh, modeling framework. Thank you so much for talking about, about the benefits of drones. I think it's super exciting and it's clear that there are many potential benefits both in adipocal cardiac arrest and other um, medical situations. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the costs um, in addition to the benefits. Can you tell us a little bit about what um, drones cost? I mean, AEDs, I think, are around 1500 or so. And then not just kind of the cost of the physical drone and the AED, but sort of the cost of this whole program, both in terms of initial startup, maybe per drone or per program, and then ongoing operational costs, um, in case there are any, um, in case there's anyone on the podcast thinking about bringing this home to their EMS system. Yeah, so Jeff, 
we're just beginning that. Our work right now has really been fee mathematical modeling, feasibility, optimization. Now we're in the implementation phase. And now we're just starting to talk about the issues in terms of cost. All our funding right now has been grant funding, but you're right, eventually it's gonna have to be funded by a provider. Based on my discussions right now, we don't have a fixed cost, but I can tell you where the costs are high. The costs are high at infrastructure. So the costs are gonna be high in terms of where you actually put the physical bases, those are the most expensive. Uh, I see us working and working with the drone industry in terms of offsetting the cost. I think the cost will be less over a lot, over a period of time as opposed to one year fixed type of cost. So I think those are the things we need to, to look at. And, and ultimately as well, Jeff, it's going to depend upon the number of uses. So I think if you were gonna look at something like that, that, that would say, infrastructure monitoring 24 seven would cost you, let's say $300,000. That does not make sense to me if you're gonna send it in an area where there's 50 cardiac arrests a year, it makes no economic sense. But if you budget it out over five years and then use it for a greater number of medical emergencies, I think that's where the cost is going to come down. But I can tell you right now, Jeff, no one has yet done this in real life. And the reason no one's yet done this in real life, all our work has been done using BVLOS, but they're being used on vetted locations. So we know these are safe locations and there's nothing in that airspace. To make this work in real life, you'll need to be able to go to unvetted because that's when 911 call comes in. We're not gonna be able to vet that airspace. We have the technology to do that. That's where our discussions are right now with Transport Canada. There's one country, one group in the world known as Everdrone in Sweden. They just got approval to do this. And, and just be careful to anyone on the call. Drone companies will tell you anything. There's recent information of the FAA that BVLOS is able to work, but only in specific areas. So in Las Vegas, in the mountains where there's no one around, you can fly BVLOS. If you're on a tree line or a power line, you can try BVLOS. But right now in Canada, North America, I cannot call you 911 and send you a drone to a location that has not been pre-vetted. We have the, the infrastructure to do it. There's no, there's no um, uh, approvals yet to actually do that. And that's the step that we're at. I think, Jeff, once we get to that step, I think we'll know more about the cost because you're right. Everyone asks about it in big terms. Infrastructure is expensive. Monitoring is in fact not as expensive. That's very helpful. Thanks for sharing yeah. that. Yeah, I think, I think it's, yeah, I think that part's the important part. There's no way you're going to do this as a researcher. You're going to have to partner with drone companies who have the technical expertise in this. Like all research, more research is needed, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was going to say that, but I figure I had some numbers in my mind. Hi, this is Bill Toon. I want to thank you for your uh, work. This is, uh, again, always very exciting to see people out there uh, on the edge maybe falling off the edge, depending on your perspective. <laughs> but um, I do think you you spoke earlier, and I think that it, it's going to, I think in the pragmatic sense of things, that interval between the arrival and uh, uh, arrival of whatever and the actual application is always a, a difficult zone. Because if you find that the drone arrives faster than the ambulance, but it, the ambulance gets there and ends up actually implementing the treatment because the providers on scene couldn't do it. You know, the, for, the true bystanders and stuff. I think that missing interval is an important thing still to look at. It's a, yeah, uh, it's, it's just a missing piece. And I, I think we should never underestimate that, that piece. And I know it's been studied before because, you know, is the missing interval. And uh, I think that that still is an important part is, you know, just because you get there doesn't mean you actually have contact and just because you have contact doesn't mean you can treat. Yeah. So yeah, first of all, it, well, that's a fantastic point. And again, this came through loud and clear in our community consultation process. It's why we work so hard on implementing it. Uh, implementing a FaceTime app. I can tell you we work with some companies who have similar 
infrastructure in place for medical kits. So you can open up the kit and it'll guide you to apply a tourniquet, use Epi for people who haven't used it before. So all this idea of visualizing the ability to use these, I think is gonna make a huge difference and decrease that time interval, uh, particularly with, with non-trained bystanders. Yeah, and one last thing we say, I know we need to finish up. Remley, behind you, that's not a Dave Page bobblehead, is it? <laughs> sure. <laughs> or it's RBG. <laughs> Poor Dave. <laughs> RBG, RBG. Well, on that note, you know, time we're, we're really does falling, fly. Now we're not falling off the edge. We're, we're literally dropping out of the drone. It's a free fall. It's, you're wrecking my puns. I was going to say time flies when we're having so much fun. <laughs> There, there are no shortage of drone puns for this one, I'm certain. But yeah, we have reached kind of the end of our hour and that was amazing. I uh, really appreciate all of your time here. I wanna give you an opportunity for any last comments or last things that you'd like our audience to think about as they read the full study. Um, Jamal, I'll start with you. Any last words for our audience? Oh, I'd just like to thank you for inviting us on. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to share our work. Well, we appreciate your work and look forward to seeing some more great EMS research. And Tim, any last wrap-up thoughts from you? Uh, well, I also wanted to say thanks. This was a this was really fun, and uh, we appreciate the opportunity. And as is alluded to uh, over this hour um, by several people, you know, cost effectiveness is, is actually a big part of this, and we actually have some ongoing research uh, related to to that topic. So you know, stay tuned. Good. Hope to have you back to talk about some of that. And Sheldon, thank you for being here. Any last comments? Yeah, I know this is great. Thanks so much. And again, uh, the importance of the collaboration between really a scientist clinician as myself, working with engineers, it shows you how much you need to think about to actually let make this happen in real life. Uh, and it's a pleasure working with Tim, his group, his students. They're all phenomenal. And we'll, you'll be seeing plenty more research uh, from our group and Tim's students moving forward. So thanks so much to Remley, the group, and especially Tim and Jamal. Without you guys, uh, who knows where the drones would be landing. <laughs> Great point. Or something. <laughs> we can test one out over here. No, yeah. I, I really appreciate again all of you taking the time to share this exciting and super interesting work. One thing I didn't get to highlight, my last comment is that this study does an excellent job one uh, displaying data in a transparent way, and also that major reduction that we saw for the 90th percentile shows that these models could have real implications practically for some of the most vulnerable populations who are the furthest away by ground ambulance. And so this is providing some early answers and laying the groundwork for future work. And thank you all for helping us disseminate these findings. Now, I've got to take us out. So as a reminder, we have our Education Research Journal Club podcast on Friday, April 23rd. And we're gonna be back here with the clinical version on the second Monday of the month, which will be May 10th. Thanks everyone for listening. We'll definitely be nerding out some more next time. <laughs> Thanks guys. Thanks, Emily. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Jamal. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.